Hey everyone, it's Booktube Channel here, and today I thought I'd do a quick review on a Japanese literary classic that is probably not very familiar to my uh, non-Japanese viewers. It's a short novel whose title is translated to The Wild Geese by Mori Ogai. And in this video, I'm just going to give a quick summary of the story, a little bit about Ogai's life, since I know that outside of Japan, his biography is probably not very well known, even though he was very instrumental to the modernization of Japanese literature. And then I'm just going to quickly reflect on my first reading. And if you decide that you want to purchase this book and give it a read, then you can use my affiliate link for a bookshop. If you purchase the book on that website, a little bit of the money goes to me, as well as some of the money goes to uh, independent bookshops around the world. So without further ado, let's talk about the book. This is my uh, library copy. That's why it looks like this. Although this book was originally serialized from I think 1911 to 1913, this translation is not published until 1959. And the English translation is done by Kingo Ochiai and Sanford Goldstein. I'll just read a little bit of the introduction because I do think it's a pretty helpful primer um, about what this book is all about in terms of its place in Japanese literary history. It starts off, More than half a century ago, the author of The Wild Geese recognized the difficulty of solving one of Japan's major problems, the adoption of Western values and the preservation of her own. He lived at a time when Japan was becoming increasingly aware of external influences. He was to reflect those influences in his career as a major figure in modern Japanese literature. So here it goes into his biography. He was born in 1862 and his birth name is actually Mori Rintaro, but only later he picked up the pen name uh, Mori Ogai. And this guy was very precocious. He actually started learning Dutch at a young age. And I think what the situation was is that his father was a physician to some feudal lord and Dutch was kind of like this entryway into learning Western medicine. So I'm so I think his dad probably inculcated him into wanting to pursue medicine and thus he had to learn Dutch. And because he learned Dutch, Ogai developed a very young fascination with the West. In 1872, his father actually sent him to Tokyo where he learned German. And at the ripe old age of 14, he actually entered a preparatory course at a Tokyo Medical College. And at the end of that college experience, he actually lives in the boarding house, which becomes um, a setting for the narrator of this book. He graduates from medical school at the age of 19 and actually helps out with his father's practice for what seems like several months uh, before going on to become an army surgeon. And what happens is that in 1884, the army actually sends Ogai to Germany in order to learn what's called here military hygiene. I'm not sure what that means. And it was there that he really started uh, formulating like his ideas about literary structure and he even became interested and quite active in translating French and German poetry. At one time or another during his career, he brought to Japan's literary public selections from Hans Christian Andersen, Goethe, Ibsen, Wilde, Shakespeare, and many other European novelists and dramatists. And it seems like here, one of the big turning points is in his life was in 1899 when he was sent um, to be an army medic at a post in Kyushu. The writer Ogai, he wrote, died there. But the military man served without complaint. Perhaps the Kyushu period had its own positive aspect in helping Ogai define quote-unquote resignation, a key word in his vocabulary and one especially important in the wild geese. To Ogai, the word means serenity of mind which enables one to calmly observe the world and oneself. The three-year quote-unquote exile undoubtedly gave Ogai time for introspection, but a more active life awaited him when, in 1902, he returned to Tokyo to assume other duties and then, two years later, when he served at the front during the Russo-Japanese War. Yet he was shortly to figure as a leading writer standing against a growing tendency, one, ironically enough, that originated in Europe. So in terms of literary history, it seems like writers like Zola, Maupassant were models for what's called naturalism in Japanese literature, people who really focus on the destitute aspects of society and the more deprived aspects of their personal lives. And it seems like Ogai and uh, Natsume Soseki were two writers who actually rebelled against that. And it seems to be Soseki who kind of encouraged Ogai Mori to um, even start his own literary journal, which was called the Pleiades. In three years, in addition to essays and translations, he wrote no fewer than 30 stories and plays, of which two major works, Vita Sexualis and A Youth, present markedly Ogai's criticism of naturalism. Ogai's antagonism towards this new movement perhaps deepened his recognition of the richness of his own culture. Born into a samurai family, raised from early childhood in Confucian and feudal culture, Ogai, who began the study of Chinese classics at the age of four, had no particular reason to revolt against tradition. Earlier, he had written stories of contemporary life. In the last decade of his career, he was to shift his focus to stories of the past. In 1912, on the funeral day of the great emperor, whose reign was, com was characterized by the adoption of things Western, Ogai completed the first draft of his historical novels. He concentrated on little-known personalities, men and women who subordinated personal interests to some transcendent cause, one they obeyed humbly. And that's really what this novel is about, The Wild Geese. So this book is essentially a very 
long story. To be honest, it probably could be categorized as a novella that was released over the course of 12 issues of the Pleiades. And the story, I've heard it's been characterized as an eye novel, but it really isn't that. It's just that the frame narrative is that the whole story is being told from the perspective of a student, an eye narrator, who kind of sets up the scene in the first chapter. But really, you don't really get to know this eye narrator at all, except in the sense that the love story that he's telling kind of reflects the yearning that he feels and the emptiness that he feels in his own life. But you really don't get to know him beyond that. Really, the focus of the story is about this money lender whose name is Suezo and he's pretty dissatisfied with his marriage, so he actually pays money for this other woman named Otama, who's very poor and feels responsible to take care of her uh, aging father, and Suezo pays her to be his mistress. And when Otama finds out, she's completely miserable. She just feels like her life is so meaningless, and the only thing that she looks forward to is occasionally locking eyes with this medical student who the narrator knows, who is named Okada. And essentially, this medical student, after he comes back from the bathhouse, he'll walk by Otama's house and they'll look at each other. They won't talk, but there's like this recognized erotic tension between them, although they never talk. So it's kind of like a love story, but not really. If you're someone who really likes Kawabata, then I think that this kind of story will be very familiar to you. Um, the focus is really not on plot or action, but on describing the people of this town. Um, as the instruction says, Ogai records the activities of university students, their boarding house lives, their bookstore browsings, their moments of escape. Storekeepers, strolling performers, servants, geisha, policemen. Ogai gives his readers glimpses of these, genre paintings of 19th century Japan, portraits past and even present. For Ogai, the external world is important. Its psychological counterpart is equally so. Ogai watches his main characters, orders their movements, records their problems. His line of reasoning goes ahead, falls back, remains suspended in midair. What to say to one's daughter? When to repay an obligation? How to guard one's thought? This inner world struggles with the questions of silence and communication, duty and freedom, restraint and compulsion. Ogai's vision is unmistakably Japanese. On the other hand, the problem of the expected and unanticipated, of tradition and emancipation, of pattern and change, concern men everywhere. So for my non-Japanese audience, Mori Ogai is probably a pretty obscure figure. Maybe you've heard of him through the anime Bungo Stray Dogs. But otherwise, we're pretty unaware of his contributions to Japanese literary history, which is kind of a shame since it's, it's pretty obvious how much influence he's had on post-World War II writers. One of his short stories is actually used as the basis for um, the classic film Sancho the Bailiff, which is an incredible movie, and I think really captures the kind of slow meditative way of thinking through a story, trying to extract emotion organically rather than through melodrama or plot. I did want to give an example of how good Ogai is at setting up scenes as a way to talk about his character's emotions. So this is in the middle of the book, and it's told from the perspective of Otama in her house. More and more people passed along Muenzaka. It was September and the beginning of the term at the university saw the students returning from their homes to their lodgings. The mornings were as cool as the nights, but the days were still hot. In Otama's house, the bamboo blinds were still drawn, their unfaded green covering the window from top to bottom. Otama sat inside with nothing to do. She leaned against a post hung with fans and vacantly looked into the street. After three o'clock, the students would pass in small groups, and she knew that whenever they came, the voices of the girls next door would rise like the sounds of so many young sparrows. And attracted by the noise, she would also glance out. It was at this point that Okada got to know her. She saw him as just another student who walked past her window, yet when she realized that even though he was eminently handsome, he didn't seem to be conceited, she suspected that there was something about him that made her feel tender towards him. She began to watch for him to pass in the street. She didn't even know his name or address, but since they exchanged glances so often, she began to have a natural and familiar feeling toward the young man. Once, before she had realized what she was doing, she had even smiled at him, an act of the sort that eludes suppression at the moment when thought is relaxed and restraint paralyzed. She was not the kind of person who had any conscious intention of making him her lover. When Okada took off his cap and greeted her for the first time, her heart seemed to lift, and she felt herself blushing. Woman has a keen intuition, and Otama clearly knew that Okada's action was done on impulse and not deliberately. She was pleased by this new phase of their friendship, which was casual and quiet and had the window as a sort of boundary. And she pictured to herself again and again the image of Okada at the moment he had bowed. So you can see the prose is pretty understated and the translation does a good job of not making the sentences kind of awkward or alien in a way that I think a lot of Japanese translations end up doing. And my personal feeling is that this book is a really good lesson on how to take a seemingly very boring or overdone scheme of bored husband, mistress, and possible alternative lover and to make it interesting not through manipulating the plot in any way but just by 
being really good at description and using objects and other people in the environment as a way to project and express the character's emotion. I mean, this is really what the narrator is doing, is using the story of Okada and Otama as a way to discuss his own yearning, his own loneliness, his own desire for love. And I think it is really interesting that this book is in a way biographical. I have no doubt that Ogaimori actually knew these people in real life and had met a medical student just like Okada, who is very intelligent, very into Chinese classics. And maybe Ogai is kind of mixing his own his own life history and biography into that character as well. And I think his status as a doctor is really interesting. You know, what is the pathology that he's trying to identify in the culture, in these people, in their lives? And why has he turned to stories and literature as a way to address those issues? So yeah, that's all I really have to say. If you guys decide to pick up this book again, please consider using my affiliate link for Bookshop. And if you do end up reading it, please let me know what you thought about it. And of course, as usual, if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. I upload book reviews and video essays every other week. So yeah, I hope you guys have a good week. See you in the next video.